Oh, we got, we've got these pilgrims, and these are these are quite nice because you because um, the hats are actually a very classic pilgrim thing. Um, though the other interesting thing with the hats is that these pilgrims haven't been on a lot of pilgrimages. Um, and the How reason you know that? the reason you can say that is that one of the really classic things with medieval pilgrimages is that when pilgrims went to places one of the reasons they have those kind of big flip up brims at the front of the hat is uh they put badges on them the pilgrimage you're supposed to be humble and humbling yourself and then you're getting a badge saying i've done so many look at me i mean that just <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's an interesting one I mean, I think the kind of art style and scheme is uh, quite nice and uh, has I a like certain it. kind of aliveness to it, which is good. Um, oh, go on. What do you mean, uh, aliveness? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess one of the things that gets somewhat frustrating as a medievalist is the extent to which you get this idea of it was the Middle Ages and um, just everything was universally horrible and everybody was miserable and died all the time. One thing that I think does come out of reading medieval texts and learning about that period is you do get a sense of, you know, people who were people and they still had, you know, humour and in-jokes and fun and, um, I, yeah, I, so I think actually sometimes having that slightly more kind of yeah, liveliness to how we look at the period can actually be a bit of a nice counterbalance to that. The game Twat is all about money or denye and influence. Influence is tracked at the top of the board here. And uh, the heart of the game is based around these nine card slots that you can see here. You actually end up picking just nine cards out of a possible 27 for the game. The rest are left in the box and are out of 54 if you have the expansion and these nine cards are the heart of the game uh, let me show you for example um, how this artisan works um, to use this card you would need to spend five denya and these are victory points in the blue and you need to spend two influence to get a meeple which then you can place on the card to denote that you have access to this artisan uh, what this card does is you can spend one influence for six money. Uh, but does that mean you can spend like two influence for two for 12 coin? Well, uh, no. Uh, the This is where the dice come in. The number of times that you can activate the card um, depends on how many dice pips you have. So here, for example, um, if, we, if I have nine dice pips, this means divide by four. That means I could do this card twice on my turn. Uh, so two influence for 12 money. If you fancy a game of Twa online. Yeah, um, be happy to. Yeah. Really? Wow. Okay. Well, I might set that up. Uh, decisions. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's definitely a wide <laughs> decision space. With, with hunting as well. Uh, so that's, that's a red divided by three um for three influence does that but and that is as as many in the group so if i use my six on hunting i get six influence yes i mean hunting right give you influence um and the troubadour give you influence um, yeah th this is this is a really um i mean i think these are actually both pretty on the money i mean hunting um again is something we don't i mean we kind of think of it as associated with kind of medieval nobility but it's very easy to underplay in modern context just how hugely important this is as an activity it's i mean in some ways this is your medieval equivalent of the of a like posh businessman taking his buddies out to the golf course um your medieval equivalent is you go out with your falcons and you uh go and hunt for a bit 
Let's see. Yeah. You you are in a good position here, I must say. So I, I'm really going to try and get my like game together here and come, <laughs> come after you. On your turn, you grab some dice from the dice pool in the middle of the board here. Um, the dice are in three colours, matching church, nobility and civilian. Um, you can use just one, two or three dice and you can only use one colour of dice and the cards require a particular colour that you use. Uh, you can use other players' dice but you have to give the player money to do that and the price of the price to pay for other players' dice depends on the size of the group of dice that you're going to use. Um, so the puzzle of how to grab dice from this pool in the middle and how to combine that with uh, combining these activity cards that have come out in the game is a really great puzzle and as well as that you have these each player gets these character cards for end game scoring which they keep secret but they actually score for all players so part of the fun is trying to guess which of these your opponent has so that you can try and score some points off it too. You've probably totally forgotten about your character cards. I I, I have been about aware of them. Yeah. And yeah. I, uh, the, the thing is, the th I guess the thing is, what I what I haven't got in my head is the balance of how like important those numbers of victory points yeah. are compared to what I should be trying to get on the board. I, I heard that uh, Chrétien, right? He, well, my mother-in-law is a uh, uh, like a bit of a historian, amateur historian. She, I've spoken to her today about this, and she said that he was like a poet or a writer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so he he's uh, one of the kind of um, major medieval kind of Arthurian romance type poets. Um, I think it was a, a version of Lancelot's um, kind of epic poem that he wrote. Um, so yeah, I mean he is. Um, Probably, I mean, I would say he's probably the most famous person on the list, at least from a kind of general medieval historian's perspective. Henry the First, right? He's like um, son of William the Conqueror. Right? My wife, my wife's mum told me. Uh, yes. Uh, assuming that Henry the First in Troyes is Henry the First of England, um, th this this was the bit I wasn't sure about reading it because there's enough other dukedoms and kingdoms that would have had Henry the First at some point in this period. And I think it, it doesn't tour the game start in 12 or 13 something, theoretically. Oh yeah, I think you're right. Um, it's Because then that would, put, that would put it out of range for Henry the First of England because he'd oh, have yeah. been late 11th, early 12th. Um, that, that's a good point. That is a good point. There's a thing called the Templar, right? And um, it's about a connection between the church and the military or nobility. Right, um, yes. And the, there's a Templar and a chief Templar, and they're about church into military. Uh, what's so, that about? so these are, these are the, so the Templars are a, a key knightly order, and they're one of the things that kind of forms up around things like the Crusades in the kind of high Middle Ages. So that's, they're forming sort of uh, 12th century. So you have the uh, the Knights of St. John, the Knights Hospitaller, the Knights Templar. The Templars have become the most famous of those for a variety of reasons. I mean, they have a rather spectacular kind of fall from grace ear later in the Middle Ages and get rather forcibly shut down by uh, both the um, kingdoms and the church. Uh, whereas some of the other knightly orders uh, survived rather longer. Indeed, actually, there is, um, I think it's, yeah, it's the Order of the Knights of St. John is still, like, officially under international law classified as a sovereign nation. Um, so they're, they're, that, that weird hangover is still there to this day. Well, um, I've heard of that. Where is that? Um I think, well, these days they don't have any remaining territory. <laughs> um, although we, although oh, this is this is just a weird bit of side note historical quirk. They did get an air force briefly in the middle of the 20th century. Um, okay. because, and Malta? Uh, th they were based in Malta for a long time, yeah. Uh, though they're now, they're mostly based in Italy since then. All right, sorry, you're... Your six is just too attractive uh, because 
I could use it with the monk to smash the procession. But also procession, get this, procession. Um, you Whoever has the most dice gets points. Yeah, that's quite a fun one. Um, <laughs> the... And yeah, I think actually it's something that other other kinds of game um, could do a lot more with is like processions, festivals. You know, th these are huge parts of people's, you know, the kind of rhythm of people's everyday lives. In, in the game, there's a hermit, right? And you get rewarded for more points in the hermit activity card if fewer people go there, which is quite nice. The issue for, for hermits a lot of the time is that people who felt that this that this kind of asceticism, this retreating from the world, gave these people a certain level of power, um, and people wanted to go and talk to the hermits to, you know, be blessed or whatever. Um, and yeah, there's right through, I think, the medieval period, you get a certain amount of tension between um, the sort of religious power expressed in this very kind of inarticulate it's coming from my lifestyle way versus what is kind of sanctioned as part of the like formally formal church hierarchy there's so there's that kind of interesting tension there although i'm sure a lot of hermits did really just want to be left alone whether they managed <laughs> it or not uh, it's kind of it's kind of interesting in a way that chivalry makes you better at fighting in almost every game that has a like chivalry mechanical card that i've seen whereas like the point of chivalry was almost to make people worse at fighting in practice. Um, <laughs> like, well, I mean, the whole th the whole thing of chivalry is that is is it's a system for, you know, reducing the amount. It's mainly a system developed to reduce the amount of violence that warrior aristocrats were doing to each other. Most okay. of what it's about is, you know, um, don't kill people who surrender and things like that. Okay, it's like uh, a code. Whereas here in the game, chivalry allows you to go off and deal with um, brigands and yes, civil um, war and so on. Yeah, which again, actually, uh, again, it sort of is it isn't quite what it's about. In that you know, you don't really need to show chivalry to brigands; they're brigands. <laughs> You're also involved in, I don't know, something to do with well, the, the exilian, Do you know, um, yes. modeling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the impression I get is that it's about um, bringing more history knowledge into modeling and creating like medieval world, you know, a medieval world on, you know, in a game or electronic. Yeah. And I think and I think those things kind of link together really well. Like in some ways, a database is a model of the past and a game is also a model of the past. They're trying to do different things, but there's some... There are some shared characteristics there. When I teach class on this, one of the first things I end up saying is the question that people always jump to with like historical games is, is it accurate? And the answer is no. Like um, wherever you're starting from, the more interesting question I think is what is being used from the Middle Ages and why is it being used? I think whilst there is no like perfect right way to do these things. There's no accurate way to do these things. I think there are still wrong ways to do them at the same time. Like there's there's definitely things where you can say, actually the sort of stereotypes of the past that are being used here, there are there are some problems with those. Not on the grounds of this is inaccurate, but on the grounds of the like mythology around the past here kind of is not good for how people are thinking about the period um so i think yeah there's uh yeah no right way there are some wrong ways to yeah. do history in games <laughs>